Loving Father, we thank you for this time together tonight, and we pray that what is heard and said will be according to your will and will be informative. Those ears will be discerning to separate my stuff from your stuff. Lord, we do pray for you to touch each heart, each mind, and each soul here tonight with your word and with your love. Show us what love is, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All righty. Zechariah 9. And I'm still trying to call him Zephaniah. I'm just stuck on that name. It's easier to say. But we will begin reading. We're just going to read it all and then we'll break it down afterwards. So starting at the beginning of Zechariah 9. The burden of the word of Adonai is against the land of Hadrach and will rest upon Damascus. For the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are toward Adonai, and also upon Hamath, bordering it, and upon Tyre and Sidon, though they are very shrewd. Tyre built herself a fortress and heaped up silver like dust and fine gold like dirt in the streets. Behold, the Lord will impoverish her and destroy her power on the sea, while she will be devoured by fire. Ashkelon will see it and fear. Gaza will writhe in pain, as will Ekron, because her hope will dry up. The king will perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon will be uninhabited. A mongrel people will live in Ashdod, and will cut off the Philistines' pride. I will remove the blood from his mouth, forbidden food from between his teeth. Whoever is left will be a remnant for our God. He will be like a leader in Judah, and Ekron will be like a Jebusite. But I will camp around my house against marauding forces. No oppressor will overrun them again, for now I watch with my own eyes. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, a righteous one, bringing salvation. He is lowly, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will banish chariots from Ephraim and horses from Jerusalem. And the war bow will be broken. He will speak shalom to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, by the blood of your covenant, I will release your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore twice as much to you. I will bend Judah as my bow and fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons. I will rouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece. I will wield you like a warrior's sword. Then I and I will be seen over them as his arrow flashes like lightning. I and I, Elohim, will blow the shofar and march the whirlwinds to the south. I and I, Samoot, will defend them. They will consume and conquer with slain stones. They will drink and roar as with wine and be filled like a bowl, like the corners of the altar. Adonai, their God, will save them on that day as the flock of his people. They will be like gems of a crown sparkling over his land. How good and beautiful it will be. Grain will make the young men thrive, and new wine the virgin women. All right. Chapter 9, and this might be, it certainly is my favorite chapter I've taught on in recent history. That goes back to when I was allowed to do John, but we're on our own thing now. <laughs> this, is, this to me was just a great chapter, and I love diving into it. And with chapter 9, there's a great break here in Zechariah. The beginning of chapter, chapter 9, both from the content and from the time and purpose it was written, it is different than the first eight chapters. The gap estimated between the writing varies, but it's a matter of a few years, 
And that's led a few liberal scholars to challenge its authenticity, since Zechariah is supposedly only prophesying for two to three years. However, I'm too late to be a scholar and too scared to treat God's word that liberally. So I'm going to trust God to have exactly in the Bible what we need to read. And this was a great one. And we should accept this as absolutely authentic, is basically what I'm saying, even though it is challenged by a few. Uh, this section is an adjustment to a more prophetic writing. And we are introduced to Yeshua HaMashiach in this chapter. <coughs> the time being prophesied is much later than the previous prophecies. And Zechariah, as we've noted before, is a priestly prophet from Judah. So I'm going to talk more about him again. I'm sure we've heard enough of that the last eight times. Okay, let's look back at verses 1 through 3. And we are in, I will say chapter 9, and then I hesitated. But I was right, it is chapter 9. So chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. The burden of the word of Adonai is against the land of Hadrach and will rest upon Damascus. For the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are toward Adonai, and also upon Hamath bordering it, and upon Tyre and Sidon, though they are very shrewd. Tyre built herself a fortress and heaped up silver like dust and fine gold like dirt in the streets. The burden refers to the prophecy being about God's judgment and wrath against those that God deems guilty of sin. So that is what the burden is. And that is the sin against him and against his people. So he's going to make things right is what we're saying there. And we start with Hadrach. Now, my first thought when I read through this the first couple of times, I said, oh boy, there's lots of places to look at. I'm going to get creative and do a map and show you where everything is. Um, I didn't do that. Uh, the, most of these locations are along the Mediterranean coast, however. It starts up in modern-day Lebanon and runs down through most of Israel. Yeah, right out of the gate, I was shot down on that thought because Hadrach is it's probably a region near Damascus, but no one's really sure, and it may just be a reference to a king rather than to a particular region. And that debate about where it exactly is, the only thing that's agreed on is what says in Scripture, is that it's near Damascus. If Let's see. It actually could be a vague reference to Persia as well. Because they don't want to offend the powers that be at that time by calling them names. So that's a possibility, but that all of these made it a little confusing as to where we're talking about. Now, if you don't know, I am a fairly lazy person. I think I've established that. So I quickly abandoned the map project. <clears throat> but I do love maps, and that's likely to happen again someday. What is clear in this passage is that the burden of God's wrath will fall and rest upon the Syrian region. And that includes Damascus and Hamath. In verse 1, we see Israel watching Adonai and the territory that he will be pun punishing. So was a change from this is going to happen to you to this is going to happen to them. The implication in verse 2 is that Tyre and Sidon are both being watched by the Hebrews and are themselves keeping watch. It's maybe not either or, but both and. So they're watching to see what's happening as well as the Israelis watching them to see what happens to them. Verse 3, Tyre built herself a fortress and heaped up silver like dust and fine gold like dirt in the streets. Behold, the Lord will impoverish her and destroy her power on the sea, while she will be devoured by fire. Ashkelon will see it and fear, and Gaza will writhe in pain, as will Ekron, because her hope will dry up. The 
king will perish from Gaza and Ashkelon will be uninhabited. A mongrel people will live in Ashkelon and I will cut off the Philistines' pride. Cutting off the Philistines' pride sort of hit me as something we won't discuss. But there's a few references in this chapter that are unusual to say the least. Uh, the city of Tyre had already been destroyed once. It was built on the coast. And that had been taken out uh, in an earlier invasion. But now they are looking at, and this is about 200 years after the time of the prophet. So Zechariah is predicting this for the future. And these prophecies are looking towards the invasion of Alexander the Great. And that's kind of clear here because the reference is to the new Tyre. And that was built during that later period. I mean, it was in existence then because it had already been destroyed. But the building up of gold, it was a major trading point. And it was actually a few hundred yards. It's an island that's several hundred yards off of the coast. And they built a huge wall, it was well protected, and was considered impregnable at that point in history. Nebuchadnezzar had already destroyed the mainland book. And you'll hit one. There's another name, and I don't remember what it was now, that the previous tire was known by. And it was built back up, and people lived there, but it was sort of like a suburb of the off the coast fortress. And they usually got along, but they would actually battle with each other every now and then. But for the most part, their trade was so lucrative and they needed each other. And when you hear about the cedars of Lebanon being set, those came from the old Tyre region, and those folks were in control of the building materials, while the folks out on the island had all the money. But it was destroyed, and that was also fulfilling prophecy from Isaiah and Ezekiel. The new tire, I put that, was about 500 yards from the land and from the old tire. And it was a very wealthy Phoenician city. The city survived about 200 years after this prophecy before it fell to Alexander the Great. Excuse me. Alexander did not have a navy to bring to bear on. So what he did was constructed a land bridge using the ruins of the old Tyre. So basically they took the materials that the old city were built from and threw them in the water in a massive building undertaking. And that also was the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy because he was talking about scraping her dust from her and laying her stones, timber and dust, in the midst of the water. So that's a pretty clear after the fact reference back to that. And it also fulfills the prophecies of Zechariah. After building the land bridge from the shore of the island, and after a seven month siege of the city, Alexander took the city and he slew about 8,000 people, enslaved 13,000, and he crucified 2,000. And the city was set on fire also fulfilled the prophecy. Now, if you noticed in, the, in that prophecy, it said, her power on the sea. And that not only includes the fortifications on the island, but it includes the fleet. And in taking the city, Alexander captured most of their fleet. And I thought there was, why in the world are they still there? They could have sailed off. But apparently he captured the fleet and destroyed it there. Ekron is the furthest north of the Philistine cities in the map I didn't make. And uh, they expected Tyre to withstand the attack of Alexander and stop his progress. So the, the fact that they fell, all of these other places that were noted here were taking into account the fact that they were in trouble now too. And their hope was shattered. Okay. The 
the prophecy, Ashkelon will see it in fear, Gaza will writhe in pain, as will Ekron, because her hope will dry up. All that was fulfilled here. And it goes on to say, the king will perish from Gaza. The government shall be overthrown. And that too is literally fulfilled. There is no government after Alexander gets through here, at least the local one. Uh, there was two months siege lays to Gaza. It was taken by Alexander and again, uh, over 10,000 citizens and inhabitants there were slain and the rest were sold as slaves. So his going through this region was very destructive. A uh, fellow named Betus was a satrap that had been there and he was bound to a chariot by leather tongs that would run through the soles of his feet and dragged around behind the chariot until he died. The new inhabitants, and it talks about, let's see, I forget exactly what the words were in mind. I go the right direction. I don't like to find it. And your version of the Bible, what are they calling the new inhabitants there? In verse 6. Yeah. Uh, I think it's four pastures. I have so a, mixed, long, a long it's a pretty mixed race. Mixed race. Mixed race. KJV plainly says that. Okay. Well, you just stole my thunder because that's actually what a, a good translation of this. You know, and that's, you know, we're not, not like today where we call each other names like that, but it isn't true. They were referring to the fact that. Nobody really knew their heritage there anymore. Okay. <laughs> Looking through my notes, I lost myself. <coughs> and as usually happens when I do forget to the print page, it is important. All right. We hope shattered their hope. So here we are. The king died. The new inhabitants, literally bastards, are not the rightful heirs. They're vile and low men. That's what they're considered. And they're aliens to that region. They're not natives. So all of those things, you know, they're not original inhabitants. So all those things are part of the description there. Verse 7 and 8. I will remove the blood from his mouth, forbidden food from beneath his teeth. Whoever is left will be a remnant for our God. He will be like a leader in Judah, and Ekron will be like a Jebusite. But I will camp around my house against marauding forces. No oppressor will overrun them again, for now I watch with my own eyes. Now that's a pretty impressive thing for God to say like to think that that's happening here today. All the stupid stuff we're not doing, he will take care of. But in verse 7, he is saying he's going to remove the uncleanness from his people and from the land. And those that are left will be his, will belong to him. And they're going to be leaders that are served by their former masters. And he's flipping the way things are set up. And Israel will rule there again. And that, to me, is the most obvious literal meaning of that passage. But it is not the only one. But the implication there really is God will cause the Philistines to cease from worshiping idols as well. Those that have been evil in the past will be changed because of this new relationship with God. And all those living in the area whether they're the Hebrew or the natives that had been there before. And that was one thing. The Jebusites were a group of people that were subjugated by David. They were the original inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he took over. They were incorporated into the Jewish, Jewish community. And they enjoyed a lot of the same privileges, but they had a subordinate position. And that's what's happening here again. And that's the reference to the Jebusites. 
Some of the folks there probably are, but it is a broader term describing the position and status of the different groups there. The Jebusite's condition under Solomon became that of the bond servants. They were made, well, slaves is the word there. But our thoughts on slavery is a little different from them. They were, you know, we, we think of it as a great evil, and it is, but it was a relationship that while you were totally subjected to the master, you also were considered great worth, so it was not taken lightly when you did things to the bond servant. And the bond servant is a status that is, you actually can choose to be in that position. And you're saying, I'm going to, I'm going to serve Carson because I know the love for the rest of my life. So that has a few different levels other than just the slavery that we think of. Let's see. All right. I'm going to read you a little bit from John Calvin because he, and he's a wiser man than me, but he looks at these verses a little differently. And he is saying that God will rescue the Jew from the teeth of the Philistine foe who would have devoured him as he would devour blood or flesh of his abominable sacrifices to idols. These are his words to my life. And even he, the seemingly ignoble, ignoble remnant of the Jews, shall be sacred to our God, consecrated by his favor. And those so long bereft of dignity, I will make them to be as governors ruling others. And that God shall be a tributary bondservant as the Jebusite. Thus, the antithesis is between the Jew that remaineth, the elect remnant, and the Ephronite. Calvin goes on and says a lot more, but I won't. But I want to include this point of interpretation of Scripture just to show you that interpreting Scripture can be a fluid and subjective thing. These two positions, the more literal one, where you know, God is just doing these things He said, may not be the only one. And what He's saying here is that He is, it's not that they're not going to be doing unclean things and He's going to clean them. It's more a matter of, we're going to snatch my people from those who are evil and doing these things they're not supposed to. And this struck me as a really good example, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but do you know that you have Aristotelian logic? you know what that means? <laughs> okay. This is an example of looking at things in a more hebraic way. And the short definition of that, and that's all I can remember, so that's what we'll give you, but Aristotelian logic is our, either it's this or it's that. It can't be both, it's one thing or the other. And the Hebraic logic is more both and. It is this and it's that, and we may or may not recognize how those connect, but God does and we don't have to worry about it. The biggie being, do we have free will, or does God ordain what happens in our lives? Do those seem like they're in conflict to us? I mean, they do to me. Because I got that Greek logic too. How can I have free will plus, and at the same time God has set everything in motion in my life? Like you go to the extreme one way or the other, and that's, I don't think, the case either way. But those are not mutually exclusive. And don't ask me how God works that out, but he does. And that's sort of where the Jewish folks go. They'll say, you know, this is true, this is true. They seem like they cannot occupy the same space, but God can make that happen. So when you are being uh, pharisaical, and that, we've got that as such a bad term, but it really isn't. The Pharisees were the, they would be considered today the best Christians around. 
than the ones that do everything right. And many of us want to be those people. But, and there's another one, grace versus law. Is it, are we saved by grace? Are we saved by the law? The Jews assumed it was saved by the law, by following the rules that God says throughout the Bible. Keep my commandments. That's not our salvation. That's through Jesus. But we can't throw out the law. That's there for a purpose. And we have to respond to grace. And we do have both, and they work together. But we can't always see how that works. So, in interpreting the Bible in particular, if it's not a point that you take a bullet for, don't beat other people up that disagree with you. If it is a point that you take the bullet for, then it's probably important enough to discuss. But we don't want to get to be dogmatic in our thinking about what the Bible says. Be open to see what others think. Alright, reading on verses 9 to 11. Now we're a great one. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, a righteous one bringing salvation. He is lowly, riding on a donkey, on the colt of the foal of a donkey. I will banish chariots of Ephraim and horses from Jerusalem, and the war bow will be broken. He will speak shalom to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, by the blood of your covenant, I will release your prisoners from the waterless pit. Okay, we're going from Alexander, a couple hundred years before Christ, to what time period? Anybody want to guess? The Gospels. We're talking, we're talking about Jesus. And so we've left forward a couple hundred more years. And this is about the coming Messiah. And to me, this is the most important part of the chapter and the one that gave me goosebumps. But I'm not going to say much about it because I think it says everything we need to say. Does anyone not recognize this as a messianic? Prophecy. Is that clear to you? The righteous one bringing salvation, riding on a donkey. I mean, in, in every particular, well, we don't know about the vanishing of chariots, but I'm not sure that <laughs> occurred too, because you don't hear much about the chariots at that time. Releasing the prisoners. George Friedrich Handel recognizes as Messianic mm -hmm. because a section of these words were put into Messiah. Where did Luke and Matthew? <laughs> Every time I and when I hit that, I hear it in my head <clears throat> musically. Verse 9a is in his Messiah. In the first part of verse 9. Bringing salvation is making it happen. It's not, you know, it's tagging along with it. The verb here implies that he is causing the salvation. And I don't know if you know this, but salvation is basically Yeshua's name. That's the name of Jesus. He brings shalom to the entire world actually see that yet, do we? He sets the captives free. Well, we, we are part of that. We are free because of what Jesus did. He will restore Ephraim, which is almost always a reference to the northern kingdom. Those are the tribes in the north that were the ones that never had a good king. Every king was evil in God's sight. But he's going to restore them. And 
He's going to restore Jerusalem, which is often, and in this case almost certainly, is a reference to all of Judah, the southern kingdom. So he's going to restore all of Israel. And what I do want you to see in these verses is the gentle, healing Mashiach of peace. Jesus is bringing peace. And I think we've all heard the coming in on the fold of the donkey as opposed to a horse means you're coming in peace, not to, as a king coming into a city peacefully rather than to do war. Jesus pointed this out often to the rulers, to his disciples, and to the people. And he did not come to bring a sword. <coughs> but he did come to bring a sword. So that's, even when Jesus said it, it can be a little bit confusing to us. But understand the first coming of Jesus was to free the captives, as he pointed out when he read it. Set the captives free, feed the hungry, to bring us his salvation. Okay. And somehow, back track there. I will, when I do remember to bring the notes, I'm going to have to be real careful to remember to remember them. Especially when I get a pile of them. All right, that's all good. So we're on the last two pages. All right, reading 12 to the end. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore twice as much to you. I will bend Judah as my bow and fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece. I will wield you like a warrior's sword. Then I and I will be seen over them as his arrow flashes like lightning. Excuse me. Adonai Elohim will blow the shofar and march in whirlwinds of the south. Adonai Tzavot will defend them. They will consume and conquer with sling stones. They will drink and roar as with wine and be filled like a bull, like the corners of the altar. Adonai their God will save them on that day as the flock of his people. They will be like gems of a crown sparkling over his land. How good and beautiful it will be. Grain will make the young men thrive and new wine the virgin women. Okay, we're doing a transition here. And again, he is giving prisoners hope. And he is restoring twice as much to them as they've lost. And this is, I think, speaking to both the coming of the time to come, the that is yet to come, and the time of recovering from Alexander the Great. Which is another thing we want to always pay attention to in the Bible. You know, we try to say, well, this is talking about this thing. It is often talking about a multitude of things. God layers so much in the scripture, we will never discover all the secrets there. But always be open to seeing things with multiple interpretations. I believe that happens more often than not. I'll bend Judah as my bow and fill it with Ephraim. He's basically turning all of Israel into a weapon that he will be using. I'll rouse your sons against your, the sons of Greece. And that is what happened. You know, they were able to, for a, the Greek culture took over most of the known world at that time. But the actual being ruled over was pretty nebulous in places, and particularly in this region, it wasn't real, a real strong control. 
because Alexander, they were not as impressive as the Romans were later. Okay, we have in the in 14 arrow flashes like lightning. God's power is being made very obvious. And he is the one blowing the trumpets. Does that sound familiar? God blows the shofar. Uh, again, I think we're covering a multitude of different times with this prophecy, including our end times that have yet to come. And Adonai and Saul, which I'm pretty sure I talked about before, is the God of hosts. And God of hosts, you read in King Jan, Jimmy and other places, is a, he's basically the general of the heavenly armies, is what that's saying. So this is a title of God that is very powerful and warlike. And God is a warrior. The warrior of warriors. And he's going to defend his people. So can anything happen to them that is out of his control? No. They are taken care of. A real good reason not to be an anti-Semite, but I don't think we have any here. And I praise God for that. They will consume and conquer with sling stones. Now, this is something I, that aroused my interest because slings are kind of the wimpiest of ranged weapons. Um, generally, that in the tactics of the time, your slingers would go out basically just to try to disrupt the enemy. They never did a lot of damage. Yet we have, and I think this is a reference to David, because David taking said the, the wimpiest of ranged weapons takes out a huge threat in Goliath. And I think God is saying, I mean, I, in this I saw modern day Israel who had no chance to win all the wars they won. But God was with them. Or had little chance. Their only chance was God defending them. Especially the first war of the new Israel. There was they were so outmanned and outgunned that it had to be an intervention of God. But that was slaying the life of the sling stone. Let's see. And then we get to the last verses. Um, God will save them on that day as the flock of his people. Again, this is the shepherd protecting his flock. And that goes throughout the history of the Bible. That was prophecy, that was history, and that's our future. And I found a lot of people trying to figure out what the, the last verse, or last verse and a half really means. They will be like gems of a crown sparkling over his land. These are his flocks. They're going to be I want to say it was crowned with crowns. But there were some other interpretations of that, but if you want to look it up, you may. Grain will make the young men thrive, and new wine the virgin women. And I had a fleshly thought there, which uh, wine and virgin women doesn't go together very well. But this is, I think, we're talking about grain, which is turned into bread, and wine, and those two things are the communion element. Mm -hmm. Those are connecting us with God. So I, I read it better the second, third, and fourth time I went through that. But that is a strange choice of words, and I think most of the folks that have read that have played with that as well. But it is an interesting end to a very powerful chapter. Let's see if we missed anything there. Right. Oh yeah, I got another half page. <laughs> but I think some of this I did otherwise. Yeah, the 
exciting final thing of the we'll live and thrive through the bread and wine. Sounds like communion to me. And I look at communion as to me as one of the most important things we do connecting us to Jesus. I won't go as far as Catholic Church does, but I do appreciate how much weight they put in communion. I think we should always take every opportunity to take communion and consider what Jesus has done for us through that. Because that is where the victory comes from. The bread of life and the wine of the new covenant. All right. In the last nine verses from our historical position, it's really easy to see that Messiah is coming twice. But it should also be easy to see that the Jewish leaders and even the disciples were confused by Jesus. That the first gentle coming, they never saw because that's not the part they focused on in the prophecy. They were looking at the triumphant king. And he will return that way. But that is something particularly when you're talking to Jewish folks now. You know, let them know their Messiah is still coming. And you don't necessarily have to focus on the fact he's already been here once. But you know, Isaiah 53 is a great place to say, you know, here is the prophecy of Jesus. And I think most that I've talked to, I've been a lot of about this, I should get to a little here, but most see Jesus as a teacher for the Gentiles. And I, I haven't run into too many, and there, there have been a few, but the majority of Jews, you know, realize that most of us don't hate them. But they also don't think we care for them. Uh, I was amazed in Israel when I was visiting. I was talking to a young lady. And, and she basically said, why are you so nice? I said, well, that's how my parents raised me. But I have been, I mean, why do you care for our people? I said, well, raised to be nice and loving, but I know that Jesus, who I worship, was Jewish, and I know he practiced, and I know he loves his people, and that's how I refer to him. And she had never actually heard that before. So there are, I mean, in America, you know, we're usually on the same page, but Elsewhere, we still need to show our love for God's people in everything we do and say. Let's see. So, the Jewish leaders, the disciples, the people missed the gentle Messiah, and they were looking for the restoration of Israel and God's kingdom in that time. And that is still to come. But what have we missed? We, we can look back and say, yeah, this is the way that happened. But would we not have missed it as well if we'd been around the most times? I'm pretty sure I would. So instead of questions today, I guess it is a question of sorts, but I want us to discuss, try to put ourselves in the time of Zechariah and think about how we would have received his prophecy and you know, first, would we have even paid attention to it? Because most didn't. I mean, he was not paid attention to very well. But what would we have made of it if we'd been around for those times? And with that, I'll open up the floor for chatting. And if you don't say anything, I'm, I'm through talking. And <laughs> jump in. <coughs> First, I thought you were getting ready to speak, Carl said, but you just decided to no, look at our resident, brilliant elder in there. I mean, that 
it's kind of interesting. The elders are all in the back. Yeah, back or back. <laughs> How would you have reacted if you'd have heard this? Well, what was happening during that time? Probably like the majority of it, I wouldn't have believed it, probably. I would have had to hear it from many sources. Yeah. When we learned about what was going on during that time, I guess I haven't asked question. Yes, but... We've been at this for eight chapters. What's going on in this right now? And Judah. They're still the building, um, beginning and end to the world, the temple. I, it just would have been, I mean, the, the prophecies in the side that you hear throughout the Old Testament are just, um, they present hope and an incentive to continue to strive that God is not going to forget his people even in spite of their misbehavior, in spite of all the things they've been through, whether or not it is imminent or not, that's a different story. I mean, that same question arises now. Christ's return is talked about all over the New Testament. All believers from the start until the end of his life. As in back, as in back again, we don't know if it's imminent or not. Those, the Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, which post anything weird. I mean, they talk about the glorious return, not the suffering servant. So I, I don't know that I would have believed or not believed, it, but it would have been an incentive to strive because it would have been the reestablishment of Israel as God wanted them to be. So. And this was a time, and I mean, it's very different from now, but in some ways it was similar. Because they are now having government support for reclaiming their home. There should be excitement, but there's also sorrow because some of the old folks know what was lost. And that mix is not unlike what I see in society now, where we got a lot of young folks excited about different things. But, and I think that's always been the case. I, mean, I was excited about how I was going to change the world when I was 16 and I was over at 25. But, and really, a lot depend of how I would receive this would have depended upon my time of life. And what bothers me is I think I would have been more likely to miss it in my older years. That's the sort of thing that's been on my mind lately anyway, so <laughs> that sort of reinforced that. That was part of the trigger for doing this. So, I'm only around for a truly young person. I only have one right up here, so. What do you do now? <laughs> but uh, how would we, have, I mean, I, I would see hope in it, and if this is a fairly hopeful prophecy, and that's different. I mean, most of the prophecy over the centuries has been you know, returned to God or else. But this is a much more gracious one than some of the previous ones in that God's going to take care of his wife. Right. God's going to restore. And it does not seem to be dependent upon what they're doing. God's actions. Now it is a remnant. But and he's also saving you know, folks in the midst of the Jews that aren't pure blood. So and that's again something that we we need to recognize that God is going to redeem and save whoever he wants to. And our real job is to cooperate with his salvation story. And you know, I, when I was young, I really didn't believe that 
God, being a God of love, wasn't going to condemn anybody. But now I see that you know, we all have a choice, and I believe this for me, of rejecting God or not. And I think that's what's being offered here. We can be part of the remnant, we can be part of the flock that He protects. And we do that through having accepted Him. And the rest, whether we are out there doing wonderful things in the kingdom, or whether we're sitting back and resting, isn't eternally critical, but it is critical in the moment. Because how many opportunities are we going to miss if we're just coasting? How many things that we can be joyful for in the coming kingdom will we miss because we're not watching or not caring? So I, I'm like you. I see a lot of hope in that. Like that's that's why this was my favorite teaching of all. Because Amen. Jesus said it in a very clear way. And chose God's redemption. And his plan to save his people and beyond. <coughs> With that, anybody else? Throw in there. This is, this is where I would be if I had been there. Well, I like this sort of thing. There wasn't much. I mean, I guess on the one hand, perhaps there was. Hopeful, there were hopeful things happening with Cyrus as he did and rebuilding and so forth, but it wasn't an easy road to go. There wasn't a lot of um, bright hope for the future because they were still living in the shadow of destruction and still people alive at that time and saw the first temple and knew what it was like and saw this one and oh my God. And were around when Jerusalem was still around and so forth. So. And this Indeed. was directed at the, those who were giving them a hard time. And that, yeah, I guess it would have been helpful in that respect. But if you don't see it, do you believe it? What state is that? Show me Missouri. Okay. Yeah. Don't show it to me. I'm not going to buy it. more than a few times. I was want God to prove something to me until I realized that's not his place. That's a, a box he broke out of pretty early. Alright. Let's pray and wait for our wives. <coughs> Those that have them in the other room. Loving Father, we thank you for this time. And we pray that we know we don't deserve your love, your essence. It makes no sense. You've given us everything and you owe us nothing. And we thank you for being the shepherd that you are, gathering your wayward sheep together. And Lord, help us to reflect the love that we experience in you to others. <coughs> hardest thing to do is love the unlovable. But you've done it for us. You've shown us how. So give us the desire to lay down our lives for others as you laid down your life for us. Thank you. We praise you. We love you. We pray in the power of the name Jesus Christ. Lord and Savior,